Um, I, I, we've been having this uh, conversation internally because uh, it's referred to, everybody it, all across the internet, it's referred to as um, DES deprecation, debt to export services deprecation. Um, and so I did a little Google a little earlier to find the actual the dictionary version of the word uh, deprecation. And you know it says something is being discouraged from use and official support is being withdrawn. So, yeah, OK, if that's the case, you might think, well, OK, I've got a little bit longer um, uh, to carry on using this. But we have also heard and have seen things written in articles on the Internet, which says it will reach end of life in November 2022. We don't know when in November 2022. We don't know which geographical regions are going to be affected first and last in November 2022. But Crimson are advising customers that let's go with the worst case scenario. Let's assume it's going to be turned off at the beginning of November 2022. And so with that in mind, there's something that we need to do. Customers out there, our current customers out there that are using data export services need to do something because it will be turned off. So what is that something? Well, Microsoft's best practice advice for the alternative to DES is Synapse Link, so Azure Synapse Link. So this is going to require people to implement some Azure stuff. So uh, this is where I'm going to get uh, Matt to get involved in, in it now. So Matt, T tell us, what, what, what is Azure Synapse and what is Azure Synapse Link? And how does all this stuff fit together? Well, that's a good point. Thanks, Mark. There's a good point there where you say, how does it all fit together? So th there are multiple components to this solution, um, whereas Data Export Service was pretty much a, back, a black box that linked direct to SQL. And you didn't have to do much to set it up and it was all managed. Uh, what Microsoft is doing is, is actually using one of their existing suites of, of products and and using that to basically facilitate a replacement rather than do a like for like replacement with shiny new bells and whistles on it so um the the main the main most important part is that they've created something called synapse link for dataverse synapse link for dataverse really is what gets your data out of dynamics or the dataverse um data tables and it puts it into an area that exposes it to all the services in microsoft stack so it puts it into azure storage and and that's all that Synapse Link does. At that point, um, you can use other tools, but what Microsoft is saying as part of best practice is that you should use something called Synapse Workspace, which is part of the Synapse Suite. Um, and Synapse Workspace allows you to take that data that's uh, that's stored in Azure and expose it to the rest of your ecosystem. Now, whether that's through SQL, through just directly accessing the files. Um, in this instance for DES, SQL is the most important one because that's how people are accessing their data at the moment, um, and that's that's the the the, the most promising you know, most promising solution. Um, Synapse provides SQL support. Uh, you access it like you would do with a normal Azure SQL box. Um, it also adds other tools as well. So if you need to do transformation or anything like that, those are part of the tool set. Um, as I mentioned before, Synapse. Uh, as a tool suite opens up your data, not just to put it into SQL, but there are a number of tools that Microsoft has um, brought out most recently at the end of last year under the Synapse banner that allow you to do a lot of other exciting things with that data other than just allow it to be queried via SQL. Sure. Yeah. So we, we've got customers, haven't we, that um, have that used DES um, different for different things. So we've got some customers that use currently use DES and then make that data available through uh, APIs so that um, websites can query um, back into effectively the Dynamics data to pull um, information through. And we've got other customers, haven't we, that use it just as um, a, a SQL database and do the, a lot of their reporting off it. So there's different use case scenarios and some of that reporting is very slow moving. Some of that reporting is effectively real time. So is it the case that we can just next, next, next through this um, Synapse link in installation and arrive at that same place for all of those scenarios? Or are there considerations for us to are there different scales of this and different ways of implementing it? Um. It's a good point. If you look on the internet, it makes it look very much like it's always next, next, next. 
if you read the um, the playbook document that Microsoft's produced, it gives you an idea and a hint that there are further considerations that you need to take take into account. Um, obviously, if people are unsure, if they if they don't have um, Azure resources in their teams, if they don't if they haven't done Synapse work before, um, or if they've got maybe a heavy compliance and security burden. Um, they should be talking to the likes of us about this sort of thing to help them make the right decisions about how to implement Synapse. Um, some of the simpler scenarios, um, which are closer to the next, 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 because there is a next, 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 and it's not the, the old Microsoft where next, next, next exposes lots of things to people. It's next, 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 but secure. Um, Can I just pick you up on that just briefly? Because I had a conversation with a customer the, um, the other day who just went through the next, 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 and then panicked because they thought that what that had done was expose all of their data publicly on the internet, just because some of the choices and some of the um, things when they were going through the uh, implementation of the storage, it, it gave it that impression. Yeah, it's some of the terminology is really quite misleading and, and can lead, you know, like say, if you've not got that as your experience and you've not done Synapse before um, and you're not engaging in, with people like Microsoft in the way we have, it can, it can sort of alarm you a little bit with the terminology that's used. I think Microsoft's stance at the moment is that um, if any service is being provisioned, that it is done in a secure manner and not open. Um, and anybody who sort of sets up the Azure components that allow you to store the data and things like that, it's 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 difficult to by accident expose things to the to the world. Um, I think the most important element is really if, if you if you look at what you need to do as far as setting up the right implementation, you can talk to the likes of us who we've spoken to Microsoft around what these different scenarios would look like and taking it into more depth than the playbook shows. Um, we've also done proof of concepts and live implementations. We have a, an active dialogue with um, solution architects at Microsoft where we get best practice and advice. Um, and we can share that with customers and it's, it's, it's difficult to find it on the internet, even though there's lots of blog posts and things like that. It's difficult to find definitive answers. Um, and it's uh, quite a new product suite as well. So obviously that, that there isn't um, that population of articles. Um, and it's always better to try and trust, you know, trust the advice of the people who built it, if you can do. Um, so it, in the instances that we come across, you know, the, the simple implementation, which is closer to the next, 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 which is still secure, um, we look at the the different a few different questions, a few different questions for each scenario that we look at, and I'll split it into simple and complex rather than the different gradients. So a simple one, you know, where you've got your data that you're using with Des at the moment, it goes to SQL, and you're maybe taking that and batch batch uploading it to other systems, um, or you've got simple reporting that's reporting directly on that SQL. So we're talking about um, static reporting, not Power BI interactive dashboards and self-service reporting and things like that. And also we'll, we're talking in the realms of, um, you know, thousands of records, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of records in the tables, as opposed to millions. Then the next, next, next is very suitable. You don't need to do any extra work other than following that process through. Um, again, if you haven't got the Azure resource and experience or the Synapse experience, doing that on your own, just using articles off the internet, it's probably not the best advice to follow. So uh, again, I'd still advise talking to us about helping you through that. The complex scenarios, which um, can involve some extra work uh, around different workloads. So if you've got an API hooked up to the SQL box, if you've got Power BI interactive reporting, or you've got millions of records in those tables, there's some of the simple questions that you'd ask. You need to do some work within Synapse Workspace to be able to convert things so that they become more performant and they become more cost effective. Um, I think one of the bigger things around cost that you need to think about is that when you have DES at the moment, you have an Azure SQL instance, which is um, a fixed cost. Each month you pick the tier and it's a fixed cost. The SQL that's provided by Synapse is a compute based model, it's consumption. So it's, you have to very much take an eye, keep an eye on um, how much data you are processing, how efficiently you are processing that. And the out of the box file formats that the data gets saved in when you export it from, uh, from Dynamics using Synapse Link are not the most cost effective for bigger, more complex workloads and demands. They work very well for that simple scenario. 
Um, at the same time, you've got to bear in mind that if you are doing some sort of transformation for the complex scenario data, then that is also a cost. So you have to think about whether it's near real time, whether it's um, batch or regular update, that sort of thing. These are all the sorts of questions and scenarios that we've modeled, we've implemented with customers, and we give best advice on what to do. We also help implement it or take fully up full ownership of implementation. Um, I think this is one of the most important things we have to get across to people, which is um, this is a new product suite. A lot of people are like, like you say, they're not necessarily clear on deprecation being that's it. Um, so they aren't, they've sort of delayed looking into it and getting that experience and getting that engagement with Microsoft. We've already been we're ahead of the game. So yeah. we've already looked into that. Can, uh, can I talk a little bit more about um, costs? Because um, I want to um, talk about what we've done with uh, another customer just recently where the, the, the customer comes to us and says, OK, well, how much will this cost? How much will these Azure services cost? And the answer is, well, it's consumption based. So we just don't know. You, you tell me. So one of the uh, models that we um, chose to do was to build a proof of concept. So we took a, a copy of their Dynamics uh, instance into a fresh uh, instance, can, uh, wired all this lot up, and then fired some example queries, some of the real queries that were going to be working from their website into the database, and some of the integration work. We fired those at it, and that gave us an idea of the cost. And then we multiplied that by you know the amount of time. We get some stats from their current system, the amount of times that that query is fired and how often and so on. And it gives us a much better idea of how much it's going to cost. But the important point there is, is in order for, in order to establish the cost of the these Azure services, you've got to do some work. You can't just, as you did with Dez, you can't just implement a particular size of a SQL box and there's your monthly cost. It's yeah. It could be cheaper, it could be more expensive, but we won't know, you won't know until you try it. Yeah, it's 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 like anything, you know, you're going from a, like say, a, a predictable or a static cost. Um, the one thing I will say is that, you know, there's no extra cost for getting the data out of Dynamics. There's a cost for storing the data. Um, it's incredibly cheap though, by the way. Um, there's a cost for doing any transformation on the data and there's a cost for querying the data. Um, but there is no cost for, there's no cost as far as API service protection limits or anything like that for getting the data out. That is the big, big benefit of this solution. They do not make a charge on it, whereas other platforms that are not part of this may well do that. You need to investigate that, you know, uh, if you're looking at those alternatives. But yeah, the, the modeling exercise is really important to follow for the cost modeling. Proof of concept to find out whether things will work. Um, we're doing less of that now. You know, in, initial investigations and modeling of different scenarios gives us that um, that peace of mind and that confidence that Synapse can do and support a number of different scenarios. Um, the cost modeling piece and the performance modeling piece, that's really important. Like I say, it gives them that peace of mind, that, indi that set of indicative costs based on actual workloads. And a lot of people who are having to take, take up this, they already have what their workloads will be. Which gives us a, a, a massive leg up compared to if we were building this for, as you know from scratch as a new system where you don't necessarily know what your workload is going to be. And I think a lot of people are looking at maybe um, not just costing it out, but also once we do those example pieces of implementation and what we use for cost modeling, they're also thinking about the wider tool set as well because they've got an example of their data sets there, and that's when they start getting more creative about making more out of the platform that they're now using to replace theirs with. Yeah, and that, and that uh, be, be, being the guy that's uh, looking after the, uh, the the data practice at Crimson, that's the bit that excites me most. That's the the latch key into my team being able to help customers really get you know, good insights into their data, being you know, having all that lot exposed. Okay, uh, if I may, what I'd like to um, talk about next is two conversations that I've had today uh, with two separate customers, two separate customers of considerably different scale. So one customer, I was talking to the organization that look after um, their Azure and their organization said, well, you know, you're a trusted partner. You can do what you want. You, you, you log into the Azure environment, Crimson, you implement the pieces, let us know what you're doing, away you go. OK, and uh, they, we, we asked them a key question, which I'll come on to in a second. And then there's another organization, huge um, UK house builder, the, the name of which we all know. They won't let us uh, anywhere near their Azure to, to that degree, of course. You know, they, they've got their own team for that. Um, and so the, 
one of the key factors with with considerations to security you're going to be able to um, put this across much better than me, Matt. Uh, it's the wh whether they need to implement the file, the the firewall on the um, storage on the Azure storage. Have I asked that question right? And so where, yeah. where does that lead us? What's the implications of that? It's interesting. I mean, e even though they are um, quite different types of engagement, and again, we our remit is different, where we take a lot more of the ownership with, uh, yeah, well, you know, you trusted, you do, you're the experts, you do it. Um, as opposed to we are the experts, we have a high compliance and governance uh, set of constraints that we manage and we uh, and we are responsible for, uh, and we'll do all of that and we'll vet all of the decisions. Um, one one thing that's interesting to point out, even in that high compliance and that experienced Azure environment with the large customer, they still are relying heavily on our advice mm. because they are not you know well versed in what Synapse is and how it's used and how to set it up. So to, to the main point, the firewall element. So in, in some instances, uh, institutions need to take that next level of security to their, um, their their file storage in the cloud. And there's two elements to this. You can lock down the storage account um, where you use um, virtual networks, private endpoints, firewall rules that are really locked down and prevent um, you being able to access uh, the storage itself unless you are on a particular network or your your network is is trusted or not. And on the Synapse Studio side of things, there's a product on there that helps. You tick a few boxes on there and it actually locks it down for you to help engage with that firewall and that VNet security level stuff. Um, the challenges that we have to go through is basically, if, if you have to do that, there are challenges be, to make sure that you can get your storage and the Synapse link working together because Dynamics doesn't sit within the Azure piece. so Obviously, we've worked through a lot of um, time with Microsoft about getting this to work the most efficient way possible in order to meet the client's needs. Again, these sorts of things um, need doing at setup time. You can't go back and change some of these settings after you've set up. So to go through an experimentation period and then think, oh, well, I'll just go back and retrospectively add that setting doesn't work like that with these kinds of resources. So having that set of conversations, knowing what questions to ask, knowing what the requirements of the client is, whether they need to enable firewalls on storage and things like that. These are also important sort of layers of questions that we have that we lay on top of our standard design. And we work heavily with our Azure practice team. And also, like I say, we engage with Microsoft to say, right, we've got these challenges. This customer says, we want to be able to do this. We want to lock this down to this set of policies. How do we do that? Our Azure team, Microsoft as well supporting us, say, this is the best way of doing it. Obviously, we have knowledge anyway about how to do it as a standard, but there's the challenge of how do you do this for a suite of products across a number of different areas, i.e. Power Platform Dynamics, Dataverse, Azure Storage, Synapse Studio, and all of the networking stuff in between. Um, I know it's, there's a lot of VNet and firewall and network type stuff being thrown out there, but you know anyone who works in, the, in an Azure practice, if it's within your company, they will know exactly what we're talking about, and they'll know that you really do need to, you know, Make sure you do your homework and maybe engage. Even if you think you know everything about the, you know, the secure setup of Azure services, you need to maybe engage with somebody who's had to go through the process of enabling Synapse. Yeah. Okay. So um, conscious of uh, time and uh, not wanting to turn this into an hour and a half's uh, worth of uh, <laughs> discussion, as they often do when you and I get chatting, uh, Matt. Um, I'd just like to summarise uh, with a few key points, uh, perhaps. So. The most important point is if you use data export services, you have to do something about it now because it will get turned off. OK, um, and if you've got an Azure team that know what they're doing, then you you may well be all right if they understand all the implications, but it might be worth reaching out to Crimson anyway. Uh, so if you're uh, a customer of ours, reach out to your account manager um, and uh, engage in a conversation with them and see how we can help you. Uh, if you're not a customer of Crimson's, then I guess uh, contact us through our uh, contact us page on the website um, and uh, yeah, engage with us that way. And, uh, we uh, see how we can uh, advise you and move you forward such that in November, it all doesn't just come crashing down and stop working for you. 